didn't see you there. I was too busy over here trying to finish one of the many, many books that I picked up in January. Oh, am I nearly finished? No. They all look kind of like this. But you know you win some, you lose some. Because maybe once I've finished more of the books in this stack, I will have more tops for next month's, you know, tops and bottoms. and welcome to another video. Normally I would be very excited to bring you this video, the very first tops and bottoms of a brand new year. But alas, as Salty Leanne has just informed you, January did not go quite to plan. And you know, in recent years I've moved from January being a month of like good intentions and lofty goals, of starting five new habits that I'm never going to carry on, of commencing the beating up process of myself when I am not living up to all of my own predetermined expectations and instead I have switched gears to January is just a month we have to freaking get through okay? January is just the month before February where the year starts. Ah January, merely a stinky stumbling block on the way to better things. And indeed better things have already happened in February, many better things, many of them book things. So I am already confident that next month's tops and bottoms will look a little less what is the word I seek? Placid. But before we get into my first tops and very weighty bottoms of the year, let me first introduce you to today's sponsors, Ana Luisa. I'm one of their VIPs, I've been with them for a really long time now and I just will never get sick of singing their praises. But whether you are new to Ana Luisa in 2023 or a returning Ana Luisa connoisseur, they have some mm, amazing things in store for you this year. Like for example this brand new range of hammer coin necklaces. I of course picked up for myself the water pendant because she is nothing if not what a spicy Pisces. But no matter what your sign or preference there is one of these beautiful etched necklaces just for you. And if you didn't know Ana Luisa have a 50% sale off for Valentine's Day. Which means that you like lovely spouse Harry can stop panicking what to buy for your loved ones this Cupid's Day. I like to support brands that are eco-conscious and sustainable and if that is something that you are passionate about too, then look no further than Ana Luisa. And if you check them out after Valentine's Day, then you can use my code here on the screen and my link down below to get the best deal that they have available. And that applies years round, so we've got your back if Cupid's Day is not your thing. And now that I've spent some time looking at my pretty things in the monitor, let's move on to some less pretty things. My book reviews for January. If you are new here, and there are quite a few of you recently, so hi guys, thanks for sticking around for my salt and nonsense. Then Tops and Bottoms is the way that I wrap up my reading month for you by telling you only about the books that I absolutely loved and the books that I very, very much did not love. Or at least that is the way that it usually works. But this month I actually have two middles. Books that I am, for whatever reason, a little bit undecided on and so they didn't quite make it into one of the other two categories. I'd like to say it's a rare occasion that I can't make up my mind, but <laughs> that would be a lie. So first up, let's just talk about the book that hit the bottom of this list without skimming any of the steps on the way down. It is a bottom which I am so, so incredibly sad about and I think you guys will be too because when I picked this up a lot of you were like, please tell me that this is good. I can't lie to you so I can't tell you that it is good because it was not and that book is They Came to Slay the Queer Culture of D&D &D by Tom James Carter. This book is one of the 404 Inkling series which is a non-fiction essay and memoir series published here in Scotland by a very very small press and is a series which I absolutely love. And so when I spotted They Came to Slay I lost my mind a little bit. Like most people who were in the geek category when they were growing up I played a little bit of D&D &D. and for me D&D &D has all always been a pretty inclusive and queer positive space and so to see a book actually being published about this topic not just like skimming over the top of it I was elated but unfortunately while all of the other 404 Inklings books that I have ever read have been a huge hit with me and have left me wanting more I literally could not wait until this one was over. And I just don't know how you achieve that in such a small book. In fact, let me drag it off of the unhaul pile. Okay, without references and thank yous, it is 108 
pages and it just felt like it went on forever and it also felt so confused about what it was trying to do. In the first few pages I was absolutely sold because in a section called Session Zero the author tells you about how they fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons, how in their very first session they were like okay this is a game that I'm going to play for the rest of my life. But then that introduction turned into what I can only describe as the undergrad essay phenomenon. You know how in undergrad when you just start transitioning into the writing style and you're just starting to work out what it is that your professors want from you and so you stick very very strongly to the say what you're going to do in the introduction at the end of every paragraph repeat the point that you've made in the paragraph and in the end say everything that you've already said but in a much shorter form and tie it up with a nice neat bow just so that the point is like driven home that is exactly the experience of reading this book. As each section went on it felt kind of like the author would pause and look at you like I, I did that bit right? Tick that box on the matrix I, I'm gonna get the points for that right? It was so annoying because it kept throwing me out of what the author was saying because you could tell that they didn't really actually have that much confidence in what they were putting down on the page and I think that that is not helped by the fact that I genuinely don't think there was enough material in here to be worthy of even just like a little hundred page book. They try and give you a through line of the history of D&D &D into modern D&D &D and then like a chapter at the end which is a weird sort of apology chapter for all the things that D&D &D have handled poorly and I still don't really understand why that was like shoved at the end instead of woven into the actual timeline of events but whatever. I just don't really know how there can be so many problems with the structure of such a small book because we then move on to contemporary D&D &D, which of course is a lot more inclusive even in their official materials and I wanted more information about that. I wanted more like interviews or even quotes from the people who had actually put this explicit language in the gaming materials and what they thought about it. But instead, once again, just on repeat, we have the same point being made pages and pages and pages on. And then on top of all of that, there was a level of cringe factor that I just couldn't get away from reading this because the author goes from talking to you as a player of D&D &D who is very passionate about it and passionate about its inclusivity to talking to you as Dungeon Master Tom. And when Dungeon Master Tom is talking to you, he is telling you a story, kind of like a Dungeon Master would set out a new campaign. And I quote, the story begins in a world spoilt by war, corruption and greed. The world is planet Earth. And then there's genuinely like three pages of this tiny book about how our world's ecosystem and politics work. It's 108 pages, you've wasted three of them telling me the story of how Earth is rubbish. And honestly those little dungeon master bits were the bits that just tipped me over the edge from like this is not very good to I am actively annoyed at this book. It could have been so much more, it could have been so much better. I wanted it to be great and I'm confident that one day a great book will exist on this subject but unfortunately that one is is, is not it. <laughs> first tops and bottoms of the year in the first book has already been yeeted across the room. Please do not let this be an omen for the rest of the year. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience but I am not accepting that energy at this juncture. So normally what I would do in tops and bottoms is I would bookend the good with the bad. I would go like bottom top, bottom top. But this time think of it instead is climbing a ladder to the best books because now we're going to look at the middle rungs. Books that I have quite a lot to say about but for whatever reason they didn't make the other two categories. And the first of those books is Several People Are Typing by Calvin Kaskulke. By Calvin... Calvin Kaskulke. By Calvin Kaskulke. Being by Calvin Kaskulke. Kaskul hmm. This is like my fifth try. Calvin Kasulke. I think that's it. Okay. So my lovely friend Amy visited me in January and we went for the first book shopping trip of the year and we both spotted this one and we're like, hmm, colour me intrigued. Because this is a book which is written entirely in Slack chats. As in, you know, the messaging system that a lot of big companies use as an alternative to only having email. Where employees can have essentially chat rooms where they can talk about single projects that don't include everybody else. And I am an absolute sucker, a complete sucker, for any book which is written in like text messages, WhatsApp messages, emails, that kind of mixed media ephemera, I guess. When it's done well, I just think it's so clever. But for whatever reason, I didn't pick up the book in this moment and so I have to 
say thank you to Amy because when she brought it home, she was staying at my house, I did get a little bit nosy about it and I did start it and have a lot of laugh out loud moments. So when she went home, she sent me a copy so that I can finish it. It was incredibly sweet and thoughtful of her and it meant that we could essentially buddy read it. And it's interesting because both of us came away with roughly the same feelings about it, but for different reasons. So several people are typing tells the story of Gerald. He works for a small PR company in New York. And one day he finds that because he's been doing all this extra work on the Slack channel, he is himself stuck in the Slack channel. As in like his actual physical consciousness is stuck in the Slack channel. And the comedy of the first quarter of the book is literally just trying to get somebody to believe that no really actually he is stuck here and he really really needs like really needs somebody to go and break into his apartment and check on his body because they think that he's doing a bit they think that this is some kind of like running joke that he has started and that he's just a bit weird and so you start getting all of the PR work that this company are having to do which is like for a brand of dog food which is accidentally poisons and Pomeranians Again, very absurd, but very funny. Carmen Maria Machado actually blurbed this and she said it is an absurd, hilarious romp through the haunted house of late stage capitalism. And not gonna lie, that is a perfect blurb. That is exactly what the first bit of this book feels like. It feels like a horror movie, but one that you're laughing at, but at the same time, you're kind of not laughing, you know? <laughs> and all of that was amazing. Like you can see, I really, really enjoyed the reading experience of this, but in amongst all of this stuff, there is kind of like a secondary plot line that's going on with this PR story and with some of the other characters who are involved. Like there's an office romance going on over here. There's this one character who won't stop talking about this very strange howling noise that she hears whenever she picks up the phone. And it's a huge muddle of stuff. And that stuff never really clicked for me. Like I was really invested in Gerald and Pradeep and how Gerald had got stuck in the slack and how he was gonna get back out of it but I just never really cared about any of the rest of it. And in some stages, I'm not gonna lie, I was actually confused about what was going on with some of those moving parts. And then there was another thing which didn't quite work for me in this one, which was when Gerald, who has obviously got a lot of time to think and he is outside of his body and he doesn't have, you know, the maintenance of day to day that you have to do, like feeding yourself and getting from one place to another. He has time to think about life. And so he goes on these massive existential rambles about what it is to be connected to people and what it is to be alive and I was like dude can we decide what kind of book it is that we are writing are we writing like a deeply political anti-capitalist manifesto with a haha -ha funny twist or is this kind of a haha -ha funny surrealist sci-fi with some of those other elements in the background like what exactly is this and I never really found out and I don't think the author really knew either it was kind of just like throw everything against the wall and see what sticks and so unfortunately all of that stuff and the kind of confusion about what tone this book wanted to have kind of took away from some of the joyful things like the fact that there is queerness suffused in this novel that is never explained or apologized for two of the characters are just revealed to be different flavors of queer and they kind of have a coming out moment to each other where they're, it's like oh I didn't know that you were and the other character's like yeah actually I am and they're both like cool cool and it was a very kind of like real life moment which I feel like is missing from some books. I feel like sometimes when a book includes a queer romance or a relationship they're like look look I'm doing the queer thing now and this one just came up organically with no fanfare and it felt amazing but like I say unfortunately I couldn't really bask in that too much because there was too much other stuff floating around and then the thing happens. I'm trying to work out a way to say this without any spoilers. There is a moment of extremely dubious consent which happens with Gerald's body. So to be clear, Gerald is not in his body, but his body is animated at the time. It does appear that there is something in Gerald's body and that is how the encounter happens. But the entire thing gave me the major X because the other person who was involved in this encounter knew that it wasn't Gerald and Gerald's body. And that's just 
It was not okay, it was not okay. Even though the characters kind of explained their logic and the author very clearly was trying to market this as like a very humorous thing that had happened. Like, oh, what an absurd situation and this happened, hee <laughs> hee. And meanwhile, I was just sitting there like, no, absolutely not, no. And so that's why this book has ended up in a middles category because what I want to do with this book is literally tear it in half and have half of the stuff be all the stuff that I loved in a shorter novella form and have the other stuff like all of the anti-capitalist sentiments and all of the mystery stuff and all of the weird surrealist horror things that felt very House of Leaves for them to just exist over there somewhere else in a book that I don't have to read. And this is weird for me because normally tops and bottoms are clearly like books I recommend and books I do not absolutely recommend for whatever reason. But this one is kind of like a well there's a lot of problems but I still really enjoyed most of it. And I wouldn't say don't read it and if any of this sounds like your jam I would say maybe try it. Yes yeah, so it's, it's a middle thing it's kind of like a test it and see book. Okay so back to climbing the ladder to the best books of the month. The next book that I have to talk about is one that I just, I don't know what I'm doing with it. Let me explain. The book that I am talking about is Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Ames. This is the first book in the, the band series and on the surface it's absolutely everything that I love about fantasy crammed in with some of my other really niche likes. In this world groups of mercenaries called bands would be brought together by kind of agents really and towns that were being plagued by mythical beasts like minotaurs and things would hire these bands to go in and take care of their problems and these bands would be the people that stories were told about, that songs were created about but this particular band are no longer in their prime. They have been split up for a really really long time and most of them are now married with children and responsibilities and crap jobs and we are following Clay, one of the members of that band as he gets on with his daily life when one of his ex-bandmates turns up and says my daughter is in a city under siege and I have to go and save her, I need to get the band back together. So again, lots of niche elements that I like. We've got found family, we've got camaraderie, we've got quite a pacey plot, which I enjoy sometimes in fantasy. And we have got older characters who are no longer in their late 20s and early 30s doing interesting things. And that's why I'm so torn, because did this book deliver on all of those things that I really love? Yes, it absolutely did. It had amazing banter, it had really tough but desperately soft boys who just wanted to love each other and look after each other. It had hijinks, there was queer characters in there. I picked this book up at the end of 2022 and it took me all the way through until the end of January to read it. And that was me starting out on the physical copy and then moving to audiobook and physical copy and then eventually finishing on audiobook. And although, as I said at the start of this video, I did start a lot of books in January and have read big chunks of them but have not actually finished a lot of them yet. My experience of this book went from oh my god I am enjoying it so much and telling my patrons on streams how much I was enjoying it and us all chatting about it to eventually in January being like I just I need to finish this now. I just need to finish this. I don't want it hanging over my head anymore. I just need it to go away. And that was sad. It's desperately desperately sad because my experience at the start was so good and then it just frittered away. And I think that is twofold. I think firstly it's because Although we are presented with this really desperate issue at the beginning where Clay's friend turns up and is like, I need help and I need help like right now. Although that happens and there's so much emotion attached to it and we know that they're about to go on like an epic journey to get all of the other people in the band together. The urgency just doesn't really carry through. I mean it's mentioned several times that obviously Rose is in danger, we need to get to Rose. But in order to do that, when they're gathering together all these other people, they have all these kind of little like hijinks. I think like in a TV show format, for example, that would have worked because it would have been like the comedic disaster of the episode and then we would have, you know, progressed the plot. But in book form, it just felt really bitty. It was like, oh, we've walked all the way to this place and so now we're doing this thing over in this place. Oh okay we've finished that so now we're walking over to this place and we're gonna get that person. And there were just points where I was sitting there going like lads this the city's is under siege stuff's gonna be burning by now like 
Uh, can we move faster? So, like, is there a faster horse that we can get? Why are we on foot? Why are we still on foot? And honestly, all of this was not helped by the fact that midway through reading this book, I was like, oh, I think I'll maybe go and order the next one so that I have it here and I can just carry straight on with it because I know that I might not be motivated to finish this series if I don't have it. And then when I went and looked up book two in the series, the actual name and the cover of it is a huge spoiler for the end of the first book. And I was like, Oh, it was exactly the same experience as picking up the second book in the Sweet Pea series way back when where there's actually like a whole ass sticker on the front, like a non-removable sticker on the front, which is like, ah, Rhiannon's back with... And I get it, I get why Nicholas Ames has done what he's done and I know why the second book is called what it's called and I know why that character is on the front, but it was a massive spoiler and honestly it took any of the urgency of finishing this book completely away from me. And is that my fault? Maybe, but it's not like I read the blurb. So yeah, this book did so many things right. It just did so many little cinnamon roll moments right. It even gives you kind of like a Robert Baratheon-esque character who gets to have an alternative ending that's not just desperately depressing. It actually did quite a sophisticated look at a disease in this world which kind of like mirrors AIDS a little bit. It had a lot of chat actually about male fragility and domestic violence and other stuff like that which was actually just great. But despite all of that I still don't know if I'm ever going to read book two or if I'm officially DNFing the rest of this series. But the good news is that that is a future Leanne and you problem. We're going to work that problem out together later this month when we go through all of my ongoing series and see where I am at with them. Yeah, I still, I still, I still don't know if I want to expose myself like that, but um, it's, it's in the planner. <laughs> we're gonna film it and then you're gonna be nice to me okay you're gonna be nice okay so finally we have reached the top of the ladder we are at the shelf on the bookshelf that we really wanted to get to and my friends I am delighted to say that I love these with the burning passion of a thousand suns you can take these three books away from me only if you prize them from my cold dead hands that I am so so incredibly glad that I have read these books and that for once I I am jumping head first onto the bandwagon with zero shame and my butt in the air because the three top books that I read in January are all part of the same series and they are of course the Lower Olympus series by Rachel Smythe. I'm just, I'm giving it to you, write it on your calendar for February. Leanne said you were right. You were right about a hype series which you knew that I would enjoy. I am invested. I am a card carrying member of the club. I love these characters more than I love some people that I know in real life. So if you have somehow been hiding under a rock and you have never heard of the Lore Olympus series before or if you like me are scared of hype and you have seen the covers pop up everywhere and then just been like eh, eh, not for me and have gone in the other direction. Let me expound the virtues of of this series to you that you too can become converted because you see Lore Olympus was sold to me as a Hades and Persephone's retelling and that is not strictly true my friends and in fact that is one of the reasons why despite the fact that the artwork is beautiful and completely appealed to me that I took so long to actually pick this series up because the fact that Hades and Persephone's story in general is turned into a love story kind of squicks me out given the fact that it is inherently about rape and kidnap and that nobody is actually happy at any point in that story and a lot of the retellings that I have read over the years have not really been retelling so much as romanticizations of that really not good story and have then in turn been extremely problematic themselves but Lore Olympus is not that Lore Olympus is a completely alternative universe where the author has taken the characters and the essence of their backstories and has rewritten it for a very different vibe. In this very alternate universe, Persephone is a 19 year old girl who has been kept at home in the mortal world by her mother and completely sheltered from everything that goes on at Olympus. And in fact, the one stipulation that her mother has about Persephone going 
to Olympus is that the only reason that she will be allowed to go there and go to college and do an internship is if she takes an eternal maidenhood pledge and gets a scholarship from the group of eternal maidens which means that she will never take a lover and she will live her entire life in service of other people. Meanwhile we have Hades who is one of the gods of Olympus but Hades is, how do I put it, an extremely damaged, extremely tortured little cinnamon roll who is just not good at being emotionally available for anybody because he has been hurt so many times in his life. But fate, or should I say predestination, shoves Hades and Persephone into the one location and forces them to interact, which starts a cataclysm of events for everybody else in Olympus. So in short, the bare bones of the original Hades and Persephone myth is there if you kind of squint real hard and use a bright light, but really it's just a kicking off point for the structure of those characters for the author to tell a completely original love story. And it's pretty perfect. And when I say it's pretty perfect, I don't mean it's pretty easy or it isn't without massively, massively serious elements. This series deals with coercion, dubious consent, sexual assault. It deals with gaslighting and manipulation and bribery. There's a whole lot of stuff in here that the author just does not shy away from. She pretty much gives it to you straight between the eyes. And I just thought that was epic. I loved the way that she did that. I actually don't think I've been this emotional about a set of characters in a really really long time. I laughed, I cried, I like covered my face and was like no please don't let that happen. I love the kind of genuine deep-seated ache that you start to get when Persephone starts to realise that she's catching some feelings. I also love the way that the extreme age gap is dealt with in this one because there was the possibility for that to not be dealt with very well or to be like skimmed over like oh it's fine that he's like several hundred years older than her but no no it is very much addressed on the page and I don't know if it's Lore Olympus that kicked this off but for some reason my brain is once again like graphic novels are back on the table they're once again an option and I have been so so enjoying a few new series of graphic novels at the start of this year that you might find that they occasionally do pop into tops and bottoms. I don't know what's happened but they're making my brain very happy right now and we're not gonna look that gift horse in the mouth. Just gonna accept this new love, hope it doesn't turn into a total hyperfixation and run with it. So that is it guys, that is all of my tops and bottoms for January. I wish there were more tops and to be fair there will be in February. So if you guys have got all the way to the end of this video then leave me the little blushy smiley face because that is how Lore Olympus makes me feel. And of course, please tell me down below if you have read any of these books and if you have enjoyed them or if you have similar thoughts to me. And naturally, I want to hear about your favourite books of January because... <laughs> That's how my wish list grows. If you are new here and this video was right up your street, then please consider subscribing and sticking around for next month. And if you're already a pal and you have enjoyed this video, then please consider hitting that thumbs up because it really does help my channel. Don't forget to check out Anna Louisa's 50% off Valentine's Day sale. The link is down in my description box, as is my code if you want to shop after the sale. And I will speak to all of you guys really soon. Bye! The urge to just plant my entire face in this book and not do any more work is um she's strong. Mm -hmm.